Good afternoon and a warm welcome to Seeker's Female Leadership in Sport. Ben Jacobs with you throughout the day. This is a three-day event, the full schedule available on our website. Good morning to those of you who are up bright and early as well in North, South and Central America. Now, through the app, you have the ability to donate to Seeger. If you can spare just the price of a cup of coffee, it would be greatly appreciated. And not only do we use that money to champion sport integrity, but more specifically, we'll be investing it on mentor programs around young female leaders who eventually eventually wish to find themselves in senior board rooms. Have some fun with us as well. It is, of course, International Women's Day today. So happy International Women's Day. And on that note, use the hashtag Seager Women and feel free to give somebody in the sports industry a shout out, whether that is a particular person that's helped you in your career, or maybe it's a more iconic figure known to all of us, a celebrity. We've had the likes of Serena Williams and Billie Jean King, but give somebody a shout out who deserves it. Tell us why, use the hashtag Seager Women and get involved. You can also throughout the course of the day, use the hashtag Stands with Seager in order to engage and ask questions. We've got a really great lineup, a mixture of panels and keynote speeches. And of course, last up, we just heard from our very own CEO, Emmanuel D. Mercedes, who has spoken very eloquently about male allies, and he'll be back as well throughout the course of the week. So please do keep engaging and have a little bit of fun with us as well. I'd love to see photographs of where you are set up. Have you got a home office? Are you watching with a young child or a pet, of course? Our next moderator, Susie Rack, only a matter of hours ago, got a brand new and adorable puppy called Sonic. So that may well be a focus for our next panel. Hopefully we'll see some photographs or a little bit of a cameo, but please do tell us where in the world you are listening from and send us a photograph so we can get a sense of what your home office, if you like, looks like. So let's move on then to our next panel now. We've had the introductory keynotes and our first debate, if you like, is entitled Good Governance and Sport Parity in the Board Room. And as I said a moment ago, Susie Rack is our moderator. I'll introduce her in just a moment. But there are three on this panel. We're delighted to be joined by Katie Simmons, Seeger's Global COO, and also the coordinator of Seeger Women's Global Mental Program. And if you you don't the money will go specifically on that. Alongside Katie, we are joined by Karen Korb, who is part of Seeger's task force on race, gender, diversity, and inclusion in sport, and also a former Paralympic Paralympic, I should say, tennis athlete. And the third member of our panelist is Lisa Baird up bright and early in North America. She's the commissioner of the NWSL and also recently named on the US Soccer Federation Board of Directors only about a week ago. And our moderator is a friend of mine and an established journalist for The Guardian, both in live matches for women's and men's football and also investigative journalism. She did a great story about a year ago exposing sexual abuse behind the Afghan women's national team that led to an arrest warrant for the president of the Afghan FA. She's one of the best in the business and she'll take us through this panel, hopefully, as I say, alongside her new puppy, Susie. A very good afternoon to you and over to you for our first live webinar. Thanks very much Ben um, and welcome everyone to the first webinar of um, the Seager Web Summit on Female Leadership in Sport. Um, I think we've got, a, as Ben outlined, a fantastic panel of uh, panel of women to introduce and discuss the topics, uh, the topics around leadership in sport um, for you this afternoon. Um, obviously Ben has given all their names but just to give a little bit more, um, obviously Claire Furlong was advertised um, from the International Cricket Council, the general manager for marketing communications um, as well, but she's in an emergency meeting so can't make it, as is the nature of uh, being a woman at the top of uh, at the top of organisations. Um, but yeah, as Ben said, fantastic uh, group of women here ready for you. Um, Katie Simmons um, will be up first. She is the uh, Seager Global C uh, COO um, and also a solicitor in charge of the Seager Women Global Mentorship Programme. Um, and she can introduce herself uh, for a few minutes um, and uh, give us a flavour for, for, for her role and, and what she does. And I'd also say, let's add in, I really liked Ben's, uh, Ben's call out for the social media shout out for International Women's Day. Let's do our own as well. Uh, mine would be for Vicky Orvice, who was one of the first uh, women journalists, um, women football writers in England, who sadly passed away last year, but was instrumental in me um, 
uh, getting to where I am at The Guardian uh, gave me the best bit of advice uh, that I've been given um, in getting into this industry. So that would be my International Women's Day shout out. So um, Katie, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit, um, tell people about what you do and also give your own shout out? I'd love to. Thank you, Susie, and happy International Women's Day, everybody. As, as you know by now, my name's Katie. I'm the Global COO at SEGA, and I coordinate the uh, SEGA Global Female Mentorship Programme, which is all designed to have one aim, which is to help create greater pathways for young women carving out leadership positions and giving them a helping hand. Uh, my shout out is only going to be to uh, two people. One is to Nick Bates. Uh, he's not involved in sport, but he's a guru uh, in terms of leadership. Uh, and he uh, was instrumental in giving me my training contract at Walker Morris, which then got me involved in sports law. And the second shout out is obviously to Emmanuel Macedo de Medeiros, our CEO, who has entrusted me to build uh, Seagull with him since day one. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Um, Lisa, you've been... Uh head of the NWSL now, commissioner for the NWSL for about a year, is it? About 28th of February, if I remember correctly, you were announced last year. Um, it's been quite a whirlwind introduction to the job. Um, I don't think anyone could have predicted a global pandemic. The NWSL has come out of it, um, well, went into it remarkably well and is, uh, is thrived um, particularly from a media point of view in the in the aftermath and the sort of ongoing fallout from the pandemic um what's it what's it been like being in that role and who is your social media shout out oh well it's been um definitely an exciting year um i look back on the past year and um you know it's hard sometimes to make sense of it but we you know we are not only survived we thrived um and um you know really uh brought back live sports in the united states we're the first team back um, in north america and um, we kept our players safe and well um, I think my shout out today is going to go to um, all of the amazing um, uh, players of the NWSL. They are an amazing group of people, players from all, some of the best players from all over the world, including um, the uh, World Cup winning uh, U.S. Women's National Team, but from all over the world, our incredibly dedicated staffs and our owners, men and women. Uh, men and women who um, really deserve the credit for the founding of the NWSL and sticking behind sport, women's sports for the first nine years. Um, so that's my shout out today on International Women's Day. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. And uh, I think that was actually super interesting because for me, for very much the victories of women's football, women's soccer were being written uh, at the start of the pandemic. And now... Um, it, it, like you say, it's fri it was thriving in America, it's thriving in England, um, thriving across Europe, and actually that the NWSL led the way in showing there were huge opportunities for women's sport to benefit from the fallout of the pandemic, which I think is really exciting. Karen, um, you are on the standing committee for gender, race, inclusion and diversity for SEGA, uh, but also you know a hugely, a hugely accomplished athlete yourself, um, having not picked up the racket until quite late, I hear, about 27, was it? Um, what uh, what does the what's what's the focus of the committee on gender, race, and inclu inclusion and diversity? How do you how do, how does it run? How do you how do you work day to day? Oh, thank you, thank you so much, Susie, for the question, and I'm so grateful to be on this very esteemed panel. So very grateful. Um, I just I also want to start with uh, an image description as a best practice, and then I'll go to answer your question. I am. Uh, for people who are perhaps watching this webinar who may not be able to see us. And so I am disabled. I'm a wheelchair user. I'm a white woman with long multicolored blonde hair. Um, I'm wearing a, a mustard sweater with a black turtleneck. And I also wanna acknowledge um, the land that I'm currently occupying with respect to the Muncie Lenape tribe. Um, I work in policy and public affairs at Lakeshore Foundation, which is an Olympic and Paralympic training site here in the United States. Uh, specifically in Birmingham, Alabama. And we're also the high performance organization for uh, the United States National Wheelchair Rugby Team. One of the things that we're focusing on in, on our standing committee, the um, Gender, Race, Inclusion and Diversity Standing Committee, which is an absolute powerful committee, is exactly what it stands for. Like what, what does the data look like? globally with respect to women, women of color, women who are trans, 
all of the identifiers, women with disabilities, who happens to be black, like, and the list goes on and on. We are focusing on uh, our collective ideas of what is happening internationally. And then we have multiple discussions as we meet at least once a month to, to have those conversations. Awesome, thanks Karen, that's super interesting. Um, so we'll get straight onto the questions. Obviously you're all extremely accomplished women working within sports governance um, on the boards and committees of numerous bodies. Um, what has your experience been of leadership in sport in, in such a male dominated industry? Um, I imagine it's not always been easy. Um, we'll start with um, we'll start with you, Katie. Great, thank you. I think I would describe it as bittersweet, really. I think my shout out really eloquently uh, described it was to two men uh, that have, have been pioneers and helped me in my industry, in my career. And I think that there have been obviously very helpful men, but and helpful women. But equally, there's been the unhelpful people, uh, regardless of gender. And I do believe that um, everybody has a responsibility to help people in their careers. That's why I advocate uh, people to join up for the Global Female Mentorship Programme. But it is tough. I mean, it's tough for everybody at the moment in, in COVID, isn't it? But it's tough, especially because um, as a woman uh, in the boardroom, often you're the only one. Um, and there's been times where um, in my career, I've been um, maybe more senior than others, but because as the woman, I have been asked to do the minutes, take the notes, uh, get the tea. Uh, and I think in anyone's career, getting the tea, there's nothing wrong with that because it's a really easy way to win over people. So, uh, you know, I would say continue to do that. But what I'm saying is that there are obviously are times when you are singled out and discriminated against. Uh, and in those times, you dig deep. Uh, and you, you do turn to other women uh, and men who can help you. And, and I think that there can, it can be lonely sometimes getting to the top, but also some women um, are also creating barriers for other women. They want to be the only woman in that situation. And that's why I do advocate that uh, we all have a responsibility to help younger women in the industry. Uh, and it's a really a call to unite and get us to unite together because every single um, act of discrimination that I've suffered or stereotype I've suffered, why not give that the benefit of my knowledge and help somebody else? Because it's not uni unique, unfortunately, everybody goes through it. So why don't we help each other in order to create more opportunities at the top? Uh, and that's my philosophy, Susie. Thanks very much. And Lisa, I imagine uh, working for the NWSL now is a little bit different because it's uh, a, a women's uh, sport and league, but you've worked in a, for a number of different organisations um, with very very senior marketing roles. Um, how what's your experience in the in 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 the boardroom being like as a woman? I I'm seeing a, a vast amount of change right now. I I mean more significant change in the boardroom than I've ever seen in my life. I'm you know long time executive in in the private sector. I've worked at an NGO. I'm now in in a sports property again. I was at the NFL, and I am absolutely astounded by the progress. I sit on a public company board, half of the people, it's a, in the uh, payment solutions, so it's a public company traded on NASDAQ, half of the um, board officers are women. Um, on the US soccer board, which I just joined last week, we're seeing more and more women represented there. And I think it's because, um, you know, women are now finally breaking through, whether it's men or women that are giving them the opportunity. I'm just seeing now is the time. So I don't necessarily focus on male or I don't focus on gender anymore. I'll be honest with you. What I do focus in my mentorship with women and men is get the skills necessary to compete in the boardroom. If you don't, I, I'm, I am very focused on this, get financial skills. If you're in the boardroom on any in any kind of organization, it is not just what you feel about the passion of sport. Get financial skills, get governance skills, really expose yourself to the type of um, complicated issues that boardrooms have to deal with. That's what's going to make a difference. Um, you know, I'm, you know, there, there really are opportunities out there. You don't always have to start in the boardroom. You could start with committees, as has been said, but expose yourself to those types of situations where you're going to get the complex governance skills that you need to succeed in worldwide business today. 
some absolute top advice. Karen, obviously um, you are going into boardrooms as a woman, but also as a disabled woman. That must be um, extremely challenging in and of itself, just getting into the boardrooms um, when, uh, when you know, facilities aren't always up to scratch. Uh, what's it been like for you um, as a, a disabled woman going into boardrooms? Uh, thank you for the question. I echo uh, both Lisa and Katie's comments. Um, it's been, an, for me, it's been incredibly difficult, but, but again, I still live with white privilege. I still live with the privilege of my skin color. And so that, that is a tremendous change um, in my board positions. But I would also like to say, I mean, Lisa mentioned, you know, there's a lot of change that's happening right now, which I would agree with. However, when she talks about the data, you know, half of um, boards are now women, are we actually looking at the intersectionality of women? Are they black women? Are they disabled women? Are they disabled black women? Are they trans women? You know, what is it, what is that comprised of? Because whether you're disabled or whether you're a woman with a disability, we're not a monolith. So what are boards actually comprised of? And I am always bringing this narrative forward, even when I'm the only one. And that has been probably the entirety of my career, being the first one or the only one, because it, it takes a lot to be that person. And um, there is still a tremendous amount of silencing and gaslighting, but I would also agree with what Lisa said, you know, get those skills. You know, when you have the skills, people can't negate what those those skills are and you can bring them forward. And there's still for me a tremendous amount of code switching. Um, when you're thinking about disabled people, just generally speaking, you know, there is a level of erasure currently that is happening that is, it is so tremendously oppressive, whether it's the allocations of um, vaccines right now, we are so often, we meaning disabled people are so often at the very, very bottom rung of the ladder, we might not even be at the starting line due to not necessarily just the access, the physical access barriers, Susie, but, but the attitudinal barriers, the internalized biases with respect to people with disabilities. And then you layer on being a woman and all of those things. So um, being prepared, reaching out to your network um, and having a network and building from there and always being vulnerable, courageous and transparent in, in any position and any lane that you hold. And the last thing that I wanna share is my director, um, she is uh, tremendous. Her name is Amy Raworth. And one of the, the best pieces of advice that she's ever given me is she said, Karen, you know, I do not lead in front of you. I lead right next to you. And so as a principal, that is exactly what I do in the spirit of leadership and mentorship. Because in order to bring other women forward, specifically women with disabilities who have intersectional identities, you have to create a relationship. And that's how we make it happen. Extremely important. <laughs> a very similar situation in um, in journalism as well in that you know you've got a whole host of new uh talented young journalists coming in to cover women's sport but overwhelmingly it's very very white um and you know that's something that needs to be addressed as well it's great that we've got these women through the door we need more diversity among them as well as well as in newsrooms generally um so i will skip on to a new question um you often need some kind of board or leadership experience to be able to get into these roles? How do we, how do we upskill women more broadly uh, and other underrepresented groups for, for when those opportunities come up? I mean, I'm thinking that women in football in England do a fantastic um, uh, board mentorship scheme where they bring two women onto their board every year, um, almost a, as, a, as a sort of mentoring program to give them some board experience because that experience just doesn't exist. How do we do that more? How do we get more of, more of that about? So uh, we'll start with Katie, obviously as uh, uh, someone in charge of the mentorship program at SEGA. Uh, yeah, of course. And that's, 
That's the whole purpose of the mentorship program. It's there for women who have already got um, a career in sports, 24 years or, or over. Um, and the mentees and mentors, it's not really about an age thing, uh, because I think leadership is not defined by age. It's about what stage you're in your career, uh, where's your self-belief, where are your skill set, and where's your aspirations, and finding um, a match. So we have uh, over 50 global mentors around the world, and we've paired them with mentees around the world. And I have to say, Susie, that actually the virtual element has mean, meant that the, uh, the program has grown exponentially this year it's been fantastic and we do a variety of things which are bilateral sessions one-to-one -one, but also importantly the group sessions are fundamental uh, and those sessions we talk about how to set realistic goals uh, not just how do I get to to be you know to the top uh, and, and it to be unrealistic it must be realistic and we must have our feet on the ground when we're setting those goals um, and having some uh, celebratory moments along the way and create those milestones but there's also leadership um, sessions as well on what makes a great leader uh, and also I know we're going to talk about this later on but we're going to do we also have um, issues such as imposter syndrome and how to cope with that as well but it's about setting yourself realistic goals, having the aspiration, and also what Lisa mentioned, which is what you cannot uh, forget and omit, which is you've got to work hard, extremely hard, not just to get there, but to stay there and to be there and to deserve your place. And so skills such as accountancy, for me, I, I come from a legal background and I cannot emphasize how that has helped me uh, probably being the single most um, sort of driving factor behind where I've got to my position is the legal side and the legal skill. Amazing, thanks. Um, Lisa, what's your thoughts? On, uh, you know, I think, look, I, I think mentorship plays a role. Um, and, you know, uh, in, in my career having been, you know, um, able to kind of lead pretty big departments in, in corporate America, I was able to kind of use a, a technique that I used all along, which is to identify um, talent at a young level. And I, I urge people to do this, men and women, which is identify talent that you think are, um, you know, exceptional, but then give them opportunities where they may be over their head a little bit put them in different situations, put them in situations where they've got to learn a new skill or a new uh, department or a new business so that you're, you're really mentoring them, not just by saying how great you are and how wonderful you are, but by giving them the opportunities where they're stretching and growing. And I think that is, you know, one um, big technique I've used throughout my life to give um, not only women, but women of color and um, people who've worked with me a, a, a lot more opportunity than, than maybe we have. And, and something that bothered me quite a bit, and this happened, I think about, I don't know, maybe it's like five or six years ago, where I was always looking at these lists of the 50 most powerful people in sports, right? And, it, you know, and they were always, they were kind of men. And I went, you know what, I'm going to stop looking up and I'm going to start looking down. Who can I fundamentally impact in my role? How can I really change the, the fiber? And <clears throat> even now we're doing things in the NWSL that are a little creative and a little different than other sports leagues, which is um, with our teams, we're making sh th sure that through our ownership, um, we're having a more diverse group of investors is what I'll call them in our teams. They're betting on women. So recently um, we've announced a team in LA and the lead investor is Alexis Ohanian and his wife, Serena Williams. There's a, there's a person that can influence broadly um, through her position in our boardroom. Um, North Carolina Courage, our team just welcomed on an investor. Her name is Naomi Osaka. Um, everybody knows these women because of the athletes they are, but what they don't know is that these are women who are really investing and, and carving out a new future and being very influential in sports. So those are just two. We have um, others, Chicago Red Stars, just a, it's a very unique group of investors, um, some journalists, some women in business who, um, you know, a, a former NFL player. And I think it is about diversifying the thought and the way you do things um, in a way that the boardroom is gonna be more open to change. And, and that is something that the NWSL is very invested in. <laughs> 
Thanks, Lisa. And Karen, as a former athlete yourself, obviously, it's not necessarily something that the female athletes would necessarily look at and say, my, my next place is in the boardroom. I spoke to Claire Rafferty, the former Chelsea player, England international, a couple of days ago for, for an International Women's Day article. And she was she's now on the board of Lewis. And when she was asked to be on the board of uh, of Lewis women she uh, she was really taken aback and didn't expect it and uh, had just never never seen her career go in that direction now she's extremely accomplished uh, had a dual career while she was playing as a banker but never considered going into the boardroom uh, on uh, her the end of her playing career how do we encourage um, encourage m- more athletes into the boardroom that have the direct experience of that Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I echo what Lisa shared and what Katie shared more specifically about the pipeline. I mean, my own experiences, I've never, you know, had these great aspirations to be in a boardroom. However, knowing that that's where it literally happens and where you can truly direct an organization and its capacity. um, But how are we prepared or how am I prepared to create that pipeline? And am I doing as much in my own professional capacity to secure the future representation of intersectional disabled women, wherever they choose to serve, whether that's you know in the beginning in a committee or just some level of governance. But how am I in my career preparing these disabled women for success at that level? And Lisa hit on it, you know, giving them opportunities to excel even when there's a bit of discomfort. Um, again, my, my leadership, uh, she always said to me, you know, it's only difficult because it's new. And she still says that to me today in my own discomfort and in my own growth and my own leadership capacity. But um, again, you know, how, how uh, you know, when we're identifying women with disabilities who have high potential, like we must share that with them as well. We must let them know that they are targeted you know, that I see or that we as, as powerful disabled women in leadership and sport see them in this role because very often you're not going to see yourself in this role. And, and that has truly happened to me because you're very, very busy dismantling systems of oppression and just trying to get through the microaggressions of the day. So you don't necessarily always see yourself in these very specific roles, but they're very important roles. And, and again, how do we nurture? How do we nurture And it's, again, just like Katie said, it's not about age. It is about capacity. And where are you in your career? And is this of interest to you? Because, you know, being in a boardroom, being on a committee is no joke. It is tedious. It is time consuming. And it is difficult at times. But you can see your impact. And more importantly, if you're serving in these specific roles, is it impactful? Is what you're doing impactful? And how do we measure that? And how do we include disability in the data demographics? Also incredibly important. So, I mean, for me, it's always about looking at all of our respective para sports and our sports for for women with disabilities and looking to the leadership within those organizations and tracking. I have an entire list of women with disabilities in sport that we're tracking in each of the sports, respectively, on the Paralympic level. You know, and who, what, what does that readiness look like? And what are the qualities that we're looking for? And then, you know, when you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. So always uh, recognizing that our disabled women, wherever they are in their careers, have this amazing potential to be leaders in a governance capacity. I'm going to throw in a non-pre-prepared question. How do we how do we get those people in front of in front of the right people, so to speak? You know, we've got. As you say, I, I imagine all four of us could draw up a list of fantastically talented women that deserve to be um, the decision makers in our industries at the top, making uh, making changes uh, and shaking things up. How do we get those people in front of the right position, in front of the right people um, who are able to elevate them if, if we're unable to? Um, who wants to take that first, seeing as I've just thrown it out there out of the blue? Well, I mean, I think that's a big question. I think there's many different ways to go about that. Um, you know, and I'm, you know, just listening a little bit. Um, you know, I, I worked in the Olympic movement, uh, the Olympic and Paralympic movement in the United States for 10 years. And I think, um, 
um, you know, we were getting back to just getting in the boardroom. I think there was a governance reform that we did early on. And I, um, I had uh, suggested to the chairman of the US Olympic and Paralympic Committee at the time, Larry Probst, that we asked Paul Tagliabue, who's the former commissioner of the NFL, to lead that governance reform. He spent a lot of time listening and interviewing to people. And one of the things that he suggested and was adopted by the board was establishing a role for um, Paralympic championship on that board. That was bit, but it only came from listening and going out and interviewing the people. And today, that um, board position, I believe, is um, held by Dr. Sherry Blauinet. She's one of the most accomplished um, uh, para athletes in the United States. And she's also a very, very um, uh, practiced and esteemed medical doctor out of UMass. And one thinks about her as a para athlete, but also think about the incredible accomplishment that she's been able to make in her career by navigating the UMass General Hospital System, one of the biggest, actually one of the biggest and most prestigious um, healthcare systems in the world. And I think it was, it starts with governance reform. It, it starts with opening up your aperture and talking to people. And then what you do is you find you're open to people coming in. And I think that's a that's one example of, I can think, it working very well. And um, I know now just recently in the soccer board, I'm working with Chris Aarons. He's, he's a para-athlete. And I think, I think NGOs in particular can lead the way here in, in a way and private sector can, can um, emulate some of the governance practices and reforms that I'm seeing go around the world here. I like what happened in the Tokyo Olympic Committee. They just replaced um, the head of the Tokyo Organizing Committee with a woman. And I think that was a strong statement by the um, the organizing committee and the IOC. Yeah, I think governance reforms uh, at the top are actually, it's absolutely critical. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, I love your positivity, Lisa, uh, and that you're seeing equality in the boardroom. Uh, and maybe that's just because uh, it's in the States more, I'm not sure. But certainly uh, when we've done a recently, uh, and our CEO mentioned it at the start, when we've looked at all the international federations, uh, we see something different. It's still less than 20% uh, for boardroom parity when you go through the international federations, which means there's a long way to go. Uh, and governance change needs to happen at the top in order for it to trickle down to the board, uh, right down to the new talent at the bottom. And when you've only got 20% at the top, there's more needs to be done in order to get more entry points, I think, for women coming in at the bottom. And that's where I think um, SEGA can play a role with our independent rating system by holding sports organizations accountable um, and we have, uh, and Karen's been involved, a uh, one of the results of our standing committee on diversity, inclusion, uh, and race and gender is actually to put in a target for sports organizations for, for governance uh, and boardroom composition so that year one will be 25%, year two, 35%, and year three, 50 percent and that's incremental so with even with that with three-year targets it's still a long way to go to get gender parity and then we have to build the political will in order to do that so i do see personally that we still have a bit of an uphill battle still when it comes to gender parity in the boardroom i awesome. you know what i i think i'm gonna just i think i've seen more change in the last two to three years that I've ever changed is seen in my life. And I, I don't know that gender parity is, is, I'll just be honest, I don't know that gender parity is actually the goal. I think it's getting diverse opinions and qualified people in the boardroom. I really do. And I see it happening. And I don't know if the States has a, it's a great, it's a great observation. I don't know if the States, certainly you look at laws like Title IX having benefited um, female athletes in the United States. And, and I think that that was a profound um, law that was enacted. It actually wasn't enacted to, to help sport. It was acted to help academics. Um, people aren't familiar with it, but I think it did, it did quite a, a bit help there. But I do, I think it's the, the awareness. Do we have to, a long way to go? Sure, but I, I don't think, you know, I'm just gonna suggest and again, reinforce the fact that there's far more women coming through the pipeline that are skilled and we're giving them the experiences that actually get them to the boardroom. 
that's my point of view. And I see that talent and I see the experience level growing up around me. And it's up to us to say that person can um, really fill that job. Um, and, and I just, I just see the, the, the talent of the next generation is, is being quite exceptional. Their, 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 their um, talent that's born in the internet, they're familiar with data, they know about different technology, they're coming up with law degrees, they've got exceptional skills navigating complex decision making environments from an early age. So I, I think I'm just bullish on the next generation um, mm -hmm. that's going to take, take care of the boardroom. So let's put it that way. <laughs> I completely agree. One of the things that always amazes me is is the diversity of uh, people's skill sets in the new generation, like this new generation coming through um, in that they've not just got one specialism, they've got multiple specialisms. They're not a jack of all trades, master of one. They're a jack of all trades and master of many. Um, and that's that's what really excites me. I'm conscious of time. and We've got a bunch of questions from uh, people uh, watching. So I will run through a few of them for you. Um, the first one is from... Uh, Becca Brown, who's a senior manager of business operations and external affairs at the Dallas Mavericks. Uh, she asks um, how you all got into your roles and any advice uh, to, to share to, to her and, and everyone else watching. So, um, Katie, do you want to start again? Yeah, I mean, just the advice is be patient, but persistent. Um, you know, get your skill set up. Uh, which is mentioned before, but also uh, don't take no for an answer and no one's waiting for you. Uh, you've got to make it happen and be proactive. That's my recommendation. And Lisa? Um, you know, it's a great question, which is, you know, make sure that you're exposing yourself to very challenging opportunities. And I would say that when I um, interviewed, it was with the full board of governors, the owners of all the team, it was all 15 of them and their representatives in the, and I really did my homework and presented a vision for the National Women's Soccer League. And I, I worked really hard on it. I uh, presented it to them. I you know, had it all laid out. I had my 100 day plan laid out. And then as many of you know, on uh, March 12th, I just threw it out the window because the pandemic hit and we had to create something from scratch. So I think it's be prepared, do your homework, um, make sure that you're you know, really on top of what you have. But at the end of the day, I think um, one of the exciting things about sport is you know, we have the ability to be flexible and nimble and entrepreneurial. And so, you know, have that quality as well. Karen? Yeah, again, I echo uh, both Katie and Lisa's comments. But for me, um, I've been very fortunate in my career. I have been recruited for every single position that I've ever held. And so now um, in my more senior um, life, what I think about is why did that happen? And who, who have I been during the last three decades of my life where people are actively seeking me out for very specific things. And, and so I would encourage um, those who are seeking positions is check your values. Um, what do you represent personally? What are your boundaries? What are you willing to accept, tolerate? And what are you willing to step into to create and facilitate meaningful change? It is not going to be easy. Also, consistently creating relationships irrespective of where you are in your career, it doesn't matter if you're in grade school or your high school, a thank you note or a thank you email goes a very long way when, when you are looking for your future. Um, I know that the diligence piece is incredibly important. I know in my own work that is at the top of my list, I am incredibly diligent. I'm also very gracious with, with my own mistakes and other people's mistakes. Um, and just literally harboring a sense of humility with respect to your success, notwithstanding that I absolutely keep a running list of my acknowledgements because in the space of being a woman, specifically a disabled woman, you're so often minimized. So I look and reference these accomplishments daily to remind myself because the person that's going to do the most work it's not necessarily going to be external. It's going to be internal. And how are you, you know, what is your level of resilience? And as a disabled woman, you know, I hate to constantly talk about the level of resilience that we have to have. I look forward to a time where resilience isn't the piece for disabled women. 
you know, or women in general, is that we show up and we are accepted in our whole sense. And also I wanna share that we speak about women very often and we speak with respect to gender. But gender you know, is a social construct. We're not even recognizing those who identify as non-binary. And that is, a, that is part of this discussion. And we need to consistently bring that forward. And I also wanna share, thank you, Lisa, for uh, recognizing Dr. Sherry Blauett, but I also wanna say in all of her success, she still lives with a tremendous amount of privilege. She is a white woman. So we must acknowledge when we're looking at these pipelines, you know, what does true diversity look like and prepare these intersectional representations of whatever the marginalized population is. So when we live with privilege, we must step out of the lane and give those opportunities consistently. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Um, a question for Katie. Uh, when does the application process for the mentorship program for aspiring young female leaders in sport for this year start? Oh, love that. So we're partway through the 2020-2021 cycle and the new applications start in June. So um, I will be opening it up. I'm looking for more mentors. I'm looking at Karen and Lisa uh, already <laughs> from the mentor side. <laughs> um, but um, I'm looking for mentors. Um, we've got 50. We're expanding. So uh, if you are in a, if you're in a position of authority and are a female leader, please contact me because uh, we're expanding the program even more than we did this year. And the mentees applications open in June. Um, and uh, looking forward to receiving all of them. This year's have been absolutely outstanding. And you're going to hear um, during the course of the next three days, videos of mentors and mentees together. So really looking forward to those two. That's been an extremely popular question. So hopefully you'll have a load of applications. Um, I am going to take the question from uh, Ian Evans, on that note, uh, Programme Officer for Sports, Culture and Youth, FHI 360. Uh, so he's asked, what advice would you have in what to look for in a mentor if your aspirations to rise to a boardroom position? I thought that's an interesting question. What what mentees should be looking for uh, if they're wanting to get into the boardroom? Um, so should we go reverse just to mix it up? Karen, what do you think? Sure. Um, like Lisa alluded to, you know, do your diligence, do the research, care about what you're looking to accomplish. Mm -hmm. um, look at, if you're looking at an organization or corporation, take a look at their staff members, take a look at their board members. What does that organization or what does that company represent? And why do you feel it's important for you to be in that, in, in that space? What are you willing to do to get there? And when I say willing to do to get there is what is the research that you're going to do and how are you gonna practice? It's like, it's so similar to being on the field of play. You don't become successful by just hanging out. You have to do the work and it is challenging and it is difficult and, and find people that you can trust who are in your own network of allyship that will, that will give you transparent advice. And it, it may not necessarily be a feel good piece, but that is something that you need to be willing to accept and willing more so to listen to, because those of us who are in these positions, we, we want to foster these relationships for you so you can step into the arena a bit more boldly. Awesome. Um, I am going to take one more question before we count down to the to the end of the session. Um, so there's a question from Daniela Forsyth, who's commercial co co uh, commercial manager uh, for Stack Sports, um, and she asks, how can we be confident about genuine change rather than tokenism around gender, disability, or race on board positions? Um, yeah, you know, I think it's a really really good question about uh, about quotas in particular uh, in relation to that and to how we make these these changes serious and genuine would one of you like to jump on that before we wrap up yeah i would just go for it very quickly just to say that it's got to be a combination of um having the right person for the skill so it's not just filling a quota we want meritocracy um not tokenism uh, but i do think targets are helpful because we've got to move the needle Quickly, we don't have gender parity in the boardroom. It's many, many international federations. And um, in order to move that, I think targets are helpful. And certainly SEGA, uh, in April, we are putting gender parity in all our internal organs. Um, and that's not a quota, that is parity. Um, and it's something positive. And we ask sports organizations to follow us uh, and to have the courage to do that. 
That's awesome. Thanks, Katie. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Karen. Um, I think that's been a really productive discussion. Hopefully we've got through most of the questions that people have asked and they've enjoyed it. Um, so I'll pass back to Ben in the studio. Hey everyone, it's Karen Kaur from the United States, currently working at Lakeshore Foundation as their Policy and Public Affairs Coordinator. I'm also currently a SEGA champion and on their SEGA Standing Committee on Gender, Race, Inclusion and Diversity. What should sports organizations do to co-power girls and women in sport? Well, as a disabled woman in sport, my question is what can sports organizations do to co-power disabled women and girls in sport? Well, the first thing that we can do is recognize that the inclusion and participation of women and girls with disabilities in sport is a global responsibility. The second thing that we can do is to provide women and girls with more opportunities for competitive and recreational sport. The third thing that we can do is involve women and girls with disabilities in all outreach programs. The fourth thing, showcase and have meaningful and impactful representation of disabled women and girls as successful athletes, successful coaches, successful role models, and successful leaders. And lastly, let us continue to include and prioritize disabled women and girls in governance and decision-making opportunities. Looking forward to expanding this conversation. Talk soon. Hello, my name is Michelle Chai. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Olympic Council of Malaysia, and I'm also a mentor on the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Hello, my name is Maisa Saivis from Lebanon. I am a former Lebanese table tennis champion and currently a table tennis coach at Antonia University for physical education students. And I am a mentee on the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Throughout my 20 over years in sports, I've been fortunate enough to shadow some fantastic leaders, both male and female. Being able to have someone that I can always refer to not only gave me the confidence to chart my own path, but there was always someone available to be my sounding board and to nudge me in the right direction. Programs such as the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program is crucial in encouraging young leaders to explore and push their boundaries within a safe environment. I urge all sports organizations to replicate such programs and atmospheres within their organization. For me, organizations must focus on Community Girls program at the grassroots level. It providing coaching and mentoring programs like SIGA Women will result in women investing mental and physical knowledge in the world of sports. Coming from the Middle East, women face difficulties in sports. Women involvement in sports is ignored as sports represents the risk of ethics, moral, and religious beliefs. The only feature of changing the point of view of cultures and societies towards women, representation, and leadership in sports is time. I'm really happy to be on the SEGA Women Global Mentorship Program with Mesa, who's an exceptional young female leader. I'm looking forward to sharing and exchanging my ideas with her. Thank you, SIGA Women, for this excellent program and the opportunity to connect with Michelle. I am sure I will benefit from her experience. Hello, my name is Sarah Soleimane. I work at FIFA in the governance department for the member associations of FIFA. I'm a SIGA mentor within the SIGA Global Women Mentorship Program. And today I'm with my mentee, Taryn. Hi everyone, I'm Taryn Horner, a mentee on the program and also the Sport Engagement Lead at Newham College of Further Education in London. We welcome you to the Web Summit on Female Sport Leadership and we hope that you enjoy the week with us. Great. So, well, Taryn, what do you think should sport organizations do to empower girls uh, in sport? Thanks, Sarah. This is such an important topic of discussion, and I think that it's highly important that all sports organizations and foundations are inclusive towards women and girls, and specifically towards the youth, because that's where we can have the most developmental impact. So it's highly important that sports organizations consider women's needs separate to those of their male counterparts and that they provide opportunities for women to be their best and reach their potential within sport and the development objectives. Well, that was great, Taryn. Thanks a lot. And do not forget to follow SIGA. 
Thanks everyone. Enjoy the week with us and use the hashtag SeeYourWoman. Like, share and follow. Hi, I'm Jerice Cologne, CEO of the U.S. Center for Safe Sport. I am so very excited to participate in SEGA's Summit on Female Leadership in Sport, especially uh, this March during Women's History Month. Um, SEGA has brought together an incredible group of uh, professional athletes, advocates, and those who support sport uh, together to really talk about some of the tough issues that each of us encounter. So I hope you will join us March 8th through 10th. Um, I'll see you there. Hello, my name is Marily Flores. I'm Women's Tournaments Manager at FIFA, and I am a mentor on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. I think that this program is very helpful because we can give our mentees the opportunity and also the tools that will help them to lead in this industry. Hello, my name is Carla Hernandez Valdez. I'm from Mexico City. I'm a sales planner at Honor Armor and I'm a mentee on the SIGA Woman Global Mentorship Program. Welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. SIGA Woman Global Mentorship Program gives me the opportunity to develop my leadership skills and grow my network. SIGA Woman. Hello, my name is Dr. Lindsay Sarah Krasnoff. I'm a historian and research associate with the Center for International Studies and Diplomacy at SOAS University of London, and I'm a mentor for the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Hi, my name is Bethany Hushin, and I am a community manager at iSport Connect and also a part-time PhD student with the Institute of Sport Business at Loughborough University in London, and I am a mentee on the SIGA Women Global Mentorship Program. Among the many things that sports organizations can do to empower girls in sports is to be authentic, be engaging, be inclusive, but importantly, to grant them the space and the opportunity to thrive and take ownership. Mentorship programs like this one are really important, um, especially as a good way for people to learn off each other from different experiences, different knowledge, different backgrounds, and also to give a bit of an insight in terms of how people have faced challenges within working in sport and how we can face them, not just individually, but together. We hope you enjoyed the summit. Hashtag Sega Women. Hi, this is Vicky Conde, a former football player, coach, and now studying a master's in sports ethics and integrity. And I am a mentee in the Sega Women Global Mentorship Program. I think that sports organizations should have a plan not only to include uh, girls and women, but also to empower girls and women through sports. And it should be in their agendas and one of their priorities so they can develop future leaders. I also think that in order to achieve this, we also need more women in the decision-making roles so we can create more diverse teams. And personally, learning from other women, not only in the context of sports, but also outside of sports, has been an enriching, enriching experience. And having female representation in sports organizations is an important step for, for younger girls and women to believe that they can be a part of the future. And with that being said, welcome to the SIGA Web Summit on Female Mentorship in Sports. Hello everyone, I am Maureen Rosita Ojonga Bobisong. I am a social entrepreneur and uh, a sports and development specialist. I currently serve as program director for the SEED project and I am a proud mentee of the SEGA Young Females in Sports Mentoring Program. Now, tomorrow is the International Women's Day and SEGA has put together a three days web summit to really discuss on key themes that involves the empowerment of women in sports. I want to just, you know, put out this message and say that um, getting more women involved um, in the sports industry or young girls involved in sports cannot be done without the male counterparts, cannot be done without male mentors. I am an example of how much um, male counterparts and male mentors can really encourage a young woman to embrace her full potential and to encourage her to embrace opportunities around her environment. I would not be um, in the position I am today if I didn't have male mentors who encouraged me, who you know, um, pushed me forward 
and who really believe in me. So I believe that this web summit is an opportunity that Seeger is creating to bring stakeholders, you know, from around the world um, to really discuss about the future of sports and also how to encourage and empower more young girls and women um, to get involved in sport programs. And I encourage each and every one of you to get registered for this web summit, it's not too late. And of course, we're looking forward to all the exciting panels and the exciting um, um, information we are going to get tomorrow. Thank you, Sita.